We are talking now about heating, integration and control. We'll be back right after this video. The European heat pump market broke a new record in 2022 with around 3 million units sold. But to meet Repower EU targets, 10 million units need to be added by 2027. How can we accelerate the decarbonisation of heating and better integrate HVAC appliances into green energy systems? What new technologies are available in the field of thermal energy storage and heating control? And where do smart thermostats fit in? Find out in our next panel, Heating, Integration and Control. Welcome back. We are now moving on to a discussion around heating and the integration and control of heating. So we're going to discuss why is it so important to decarbonize heating? What are the challenges? And how can new technology aid the switch? For this discussion, we have Jan Rombolotto, Director, Group, Digital Strategy and Transformation at Viant Group. He is responsible for the Digital Strategy and Transformation Unit. Prior to this role, he gained experience working for energy and software Fortune 500 companies. Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. Joining him, we also have Claire Thornhill, Associate Director at Frontier Economics. She advises clients on the low on the low carbon energy transition with a particular focus on low carbon heating. Her clients include governments, investors, and energy networks. Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. Then we have Denise Conway, who is CEO at Helio Storage an innovative company dedicated to decarbonizing heating through the integration of thermal storage to create energy efficient systems. They're on a mission to offer low cost sustainable solutions for both heating and cooling. Thank you so much for being here today, Denise. Thank you so much for having me. And last but not least, we have Till Schicker, Head of Solution Businesses at Tardo. Till is an experienced commercial management and business development leader as well as a smart energy pioneer with an entrepreneurial spirit. Prior to joining Tardo, he worked in the strategy consulting industry at Bain & Company with a focus on private equity and industrial goods. Till, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. All right, let's go straight into the discussion. So, Claire, why is it so important to decarbonize heating and where are we currently in the race towards sustainable heating? Thanks very much. It's a, it's a great question. I guess the the key thing is that heat will almost will have to almost completely decarbonize if we're going to meet net zero uh, by 2050. And uh, buildings emissions from buildings are really a really significant part of emissions across Europe um, at present. So in the UK, emissions from buildings are around 30 percent of total emissions. And it's a kind of similar figure across Europe as a whole. Um, and there's been great strides made in recent years um, in the electricity sector and surface transport is really now taking off as well in terms of decarbonisation. But there's quite a few different challenges in low carbon heat. And it's really time now that those challenges are tackled. I think some of the challenges relate to the fact that to decarbonise heat, you have to go into people's homes um, and that brings risk. It brings hassle. And it's generally quite a, a difficult thing to do. It's not a, as, as kind of maybe as an exciting proposition as, as getting a, an electric vehicle. The supply chain of installers is, um, tends to be a little bit risk averse as a lot of small companies that um, maybe is quite costly for them to take on new technologies. Um, and of course, there's the higher upfront costs of the, the low carbon technologies relative to um, the, the incumbent technologies, even if they, they, they should eventually have, have lower running costs. But even with all of that, um, there is quite a lot to be positive about. Um, so in 2022, there were, according to the Commission, there were 3 million heat pumps rolled out across Europe. Um, the UK isn't doing quite so well on, on, on that front, but I think quite a lot of new technology or new policies are now being introduced. Um, and the ambition for heat pump rollout is really quite high. So um, 
yeah, hoping that we'll see a similar um, transformation like we've seen in surface transport recently. Thank you, Claire. Very nice introduction to the topic. And Jan, building on top of that, what from your perspective are some of the key aspects to ensure uh, to make the switch to sustainable heating? Mm, I think overall the good news is that the technology is largely there. Yeah? Um, we have the power to do so. Um, we are talking about heat pumps, we are talking about district heating, we are talking about renewable energy, which is already available. And the question we have at this point in time is rather to scale it, to deploy the technology. Um, and we need to scale and de deploy the technology in an environment where we have a legacy environment. So basically, we have an existing gas infrastructure, we have an existing grid infrastructure, we have existing heating solutions in the home, uh, and the heating system in the homes are durable goods. So they are not going to be exchanged every five years, but they last for 10, 20, sometimes 30, or even more years. Um, and in this yeah, overall situation, I think what we to some degree need to learn is patient, yeah, because we are talking about legacy infrastructure transformation. Um, but I also see a lot of positive momentum and development. I mean, we had the numbers of scaling heat pumps, for example, in, in the heating transition we have at this point in time. We can all expect that this is even going to be accelerated over the next years. And, you know, to deploy the technology, in my opinion, is the hardest and toughest challenge we need to solve in our industry. Thanks, Jan. And Till, why is it so important to leverage new technology in the decarbonisation of heating? Sure. So I, I think the, the key is that um, new technology is improving the value for the end user, first of all, right? So it's not only about decarbonisation, it's also about saving energy, reducing the costs, but also improving um, the ease of use and the comfort for the, for the end user. Um, like Jan said, we have all the technology and uh, on top of what Jan um, mentioned, I would also add, we have the technology for connectivity and the software and the algorithms to basically connect all of these assets in a smart way, right? And this is one of the prerequisites for a world powered by renewable energy, right? That we have all the flexible assets connected and smart in order to sync the production and the demand of renewable energy. Thank you, Till. And Jan, going a little bit deeper into that, um, what you mentioned before, what sort of technology is available uh, around heating? And yeah, do you think we need to see more of anything in particular? Mm, potentially, I can just re-highlight a little bit what I have been, you know, highlighting before. It's basically, I mean, it's it's not about new technologies. I believe, yeah, to a certain degree, in the portfolio of solutions we have, of course, some technologies might come up, but you know, in general, the technology to you know have a large impact on sustainable heating is already there today. Um, and we need to scale it. Yeah? Of course, we will see, I think, some severe advancement, especially in the collaboration of, of uh, assets. For example, the combination of a heat pump with a PV system, dynamic tariffs, and so on and so forth. Uh, but overall, I think, again, it's not a technology challenge, it's rather a um, deployment challenge. And the deployment challenge is very much linked of course, to the uh, value for the end customers, yeah, because it needs to have value for the end customers in terms of yeah, ease of use, comfort, but also costs. Yeah, uh, but it needs also to be a value for the partners uh, um, of, for example, our organization, which are deploying the technology. Basically, the, the craftsmen who are on the company and the side of the end customer. For them, it needs to be easy to install a heat pump, to maintain a heat pump, um, and so on and so forth. So. I think this is something where we see also quite severe advancements in, in the upcoming years, for example, that our industry will ship uh, heat pumps, which will be even more easy to install than they are already today. Um, but overall, again, I think we need to make it for everybody as easy as possible uh, to, to make it happen. Yeah, I think that's my key message. Thanks, Jan. And Denise, can you tell us a little bit about the use cases for heat storage and why this is so important in the transition? Yeah, so if we think about energy usage, so if we're going to have a system that is using a heat pump, 
the, that heat pump is going to use electrical energy. Now, if you combine a storage and some solar thermal along with the heat pump, then you're able to use about 25% of the electrical energy that you would have used if you were just using a heat pump on its own. So this can have quite a dramatic impact for the end customer. And it also prevents a problem further down the road. So we, we obviously were striving to reach net zero. And if we use electrification to reach net zero, we introduce a problem where the amount of electrical energy that's needed is dramatically increased. So this allows the use of, let's say, existing technology, because again, this technology does exist already presently. So it allows us to use it in in a more intelligent way. And of course, then when it comes to the environment within the home, we can also control that in a better way. One of the really nice things when you have one of these systems is that you can capitalize that same system to provide cooling during the summer. So combined heating and cooling from a single system. And this is this is really a benefit. And the smart uh, technology that is managing the climate in the house contributes to that. So uh, all in all, you, you take it all together and what you end up with is a, a better a better system for the end customer with lower costs and also, a, let's say, a faster shift towards decarbonisation without introducing an additional issue with uh, over electrification, shall we call it. Thanks, Denise. And Till, can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of th smart thermostats and how do these compare to heating systems that are controlled by an energy management system? Sure. So I wouldn't see it as an either or. So I we always see smart thermostats as an integral part of any EMS. Uh, sure, you, you could also potentially um, connect the heat source directly to an energy management system without a smart thermostat, but if you do so, you lose the element of customer comfort, which is from our um, experience, from our research, key for the adoption of energy management systems. And then you also lose multi-room and multi-zone control capabilities, which are also important, again, for the comfort, but also for the savings. So, um, yes, you can do heating control without a smart thermostat, but we see it as an integral part, and also most of the EMS systems that are rolled out have a sort of smart thermostat. Okay. And building on that, um, I found a report by Emergen Research that said the global smart thermostat market is projected to reach a market value of 19.87 billion US dollars by 2032. What do you think needs to be done to ensure that we achieve this prospect? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, there's also a lot of good news um, and good development. So uh, according to the to this report, we are today at 3 billion a market value worldwide, right? I can only speak for Europe because we don't have business in Asia and the US. Um, but that means that we need to grow around 23% year over year to get to these 20 billion by uh, 2032. And this growth is realistic because this is also the yearly growth that we saw over the last five years, year over year. So we are not off, we are on track. Um, but of course, uh, we could be faster and I hope that we are fast in the future. But I think in order to be faster, we need a couple of things. So one is, of course, also that uh, smart thermostats, but also EMS get more into the center of uh, the regulators or the policymakers' attention and are also part of the incentivation schemes across Europe. But then also that we as an industry uh, continue to improve um, the system openness, like Janot's already said, and the connectivity standards across the assets and the systems that we improve continuously the value propositions for the customers and that we also reduce the system costs, as uh, Claire also said, that we have to drive them down forward uh, to make it really a mass market um, proposition. And building on this connectivity aspect, Jan, why is it so important to integrate heating with other sectors and heating devices with other devices, for example, in a household? Mm, well, simply speaking, basically, in the past, or we are basically transforming from, from, from a gas-dominated heating market to a more electrical-dominated heating market, but this will take time. Huh? We're talking about decades here. Um, and the biggest difference between both is that, you know, a gas system was basically just consuming gas and translating um, uh, basically gas into hot water, um, and it was a standalone system, largely. Yeah? 
Um, an electrical heating system is a little bit different, and this is also uh, paired to the advantages of it in terms of sustainability, because an electrical uh, heating system, you of course, can uh, combine uh, with uh, prosumer assets, yeah? for example, a PV system. So basically, you can uh, heat your home uh, with uh, PV, renewable energy, you have potentially on your own roof or you are you know getting from the grid renewable energy from wind parks and so on and so forth so talking about um, electrical heating systems as mentioned before that's why also this um, you know connectivity standards are so important are being integrated to other systems uh, leveraging all the potential and advantages of it um, and i think we are already will speak also a little bit later about peak shaving for example and so forth and so on so i think there are a lot of opportunities involved and this is why the importance is is, is so high yeah? because sustainability will be allowed through the, the interoperability of the systems. Thanks Jan. We've had a question from the audience that touches on accessibility of sustainable, uh, sustainable heating. So Claire, I might direct this towards you from a kind of general economic perspective. Uh, heat pumps are often spoken from a single family point of view. But the bulk of Europeans live in rented apartments. How can we deploy them cost effectively? So I guess heat pumps are one really crucial way to, to decarbonize the energy system. But district heat, and that could be kind of one large heat pump serving an entire uh, building, is also going to be really important. Um, and that is certainly something that we would expect to see um, as, as apartment blocks are, are, um, uh, are decarbonized. I think there's also um, uh, potentially where um, the heat requirements are lower. There's also um, instead of kind of full air to water heat pumps, air to air heat pumps can help um, and they can be less costly to install. So I think there's quite a, a wide range of, of low carbon options um, yeah, available. Thank you. And going back to the uh, smart thermostat discussion, Till, a recent review by the US National Bureau of Economic Research estimated that th smart thermostats increase electricity and gas con consumption by 2.3% and 4.2% respectively. While consumers may use their thermostats to reduce temperatures at certain times of the day, they also use the greater control and convenience to make their homes more comfortable often called the rebound effect. Have you witnessed this? And how can we ensure more generally that consumers don't use uh, sustainable choices and then kind of balance that with more detrimental behaviour? It's an interesting study. So I haven't heard about that one before. So I'm also curious to, to hear Jan's point of view because I know that Weiland is also rolling out a lot of um, thermostats and smart thermostats in the field. But on our side, no, um, we are not witnessing this effect and we are on the market now for 10 years. So I can just speculate maybe in the US, I mean, heating infrastructure is different for sure, maybe also consumer behavior. But in Europe where we are active, um, I mean, we are continuously running um, uh, calculations of how much our customers are saving and we have 3.5 million connected thermostats in the market and our average savings is around 20, 22%. Um, compared to a normal thermostat with, an, with a night setback temperature. And also other studies from competitors from, of us like Nest, uh, Google and others have, have continuously found savings 12, 15%. So no, we, we don't see this rebound effect. But what we do see is an awareness effect because if people um, are not used to thermostats or smart thermostats before, they have no clue about their inside temperature and about the humidity in their home. So they are, they they do now uh, see that and they make more elaborate choices of what comfort level they want to have that one for sure but we don't see an impact on the savings there and maybe second part in general i believe that in order to ensure that we have to ensure that energy is priced with its true costs um so which would then incentivize people to act more sustainably and what i mean with that is that for example when you can offer dynamic tariffs and uh, prices are fluctuating over the day you should pass on these prices to customers so they can adapt their uh, behavior accordingly and therefore you can sink uh, the demand and the supply of the renewable energy i think this is the much better model compared to a model where you do like flat rate tariffs or which are not incentivizing people to change their behavior so i think this is in general more important thanks jan do you have anything to add to that I think like overall 
comfort and cost need to go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, we can't force end customers to basically freeze um, to you know, dive into a more sustainable world. This is not going to work, right? Um, and what we see from our observations is that you know, giving customers more control over the heating systems via, for example, an app doesn't provoke more energy consumption. Um, having said that, I think overall, long term, a heating system is rather a low engagement product. Yeah, so it's not something you should yeah interact with like on a yeah daily basis even potentially. Yeah, because I mean this this is should just work, should just be efficient, right? Uh, and this is something uh, where we can leverage a lot with smart technologies. Um, and I think we are not at the end of the road in doing so. Thank you, Jan. And uh, we've had a question from the audience, which I think they've uh, seen my notes and stolen one of my next questions. But uh, basically, Claire, heat pumps obviously cause a, a huge increase in energy demand. Do you see heat pumps playing a major role in the grid as a flexible asset or more in the demand and response market? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about um, uh, peak demand in two ways. So the sort of peaks that you might get on a daily basis um, where um, with the help of the smart thermostats and the, the storage that Denise has been talking about, you can shift your demand across the day, particularly in a, in a really well insulated home. Um, that versus the the peak in seasonal seasonal demand. So so the fact that um, uh, notwithstanding maybe more air conditioning use in the future, uh, there will be a much greater electricity demand in the winter um, than the, than there has been previously with with a move from gas to to heat pumps. Um, but there's um, a lot of things that can be introduced to mitigate um, that. Sorry, my light has just gone. Um, uh, so um, uh, at Frontier, we've been also considering the role of interseasonal storage. Um, so that could be, for example, low carbon hydrogen or um, plants, um, low carbon electricity plants um, that are suitable, um, that are dispatchable and suitable to, to run at um, relatively low load factors also. So um, heat pumps um, definitely will, will increase peak demand in winter, but it's not necessarily something that the system can't handle. And of course, um, within day, there's a lot of potential um, to provide demand side response from heat pumps. And maybe Thank I can you. just jump in here as well, because Absolutely. I'm actually I'm actually talking about seasonal storage. It is seasonal thermal storage that we offer. So this really adds a benefit and it's here already. I mean, we think, oh, in the future we'll have this, but it's actually already here. So we have the ability to capture heat during the a six month charging period. So during the spring and the summer, and this, the heat can be, just, it can be made available when it's needed. And the really nice thing with the control of the system is that you can decide what is the most efficient use of the heat, whether it is to use it directly, pass it through a heat pump, send it to storage, um, and, and vice versa, you know, both in both directions. So with a combination of heat pump, solar thermal, uh, thermal energy storage that is both a short-term storage and the seasonal storage, you can provide a, a system that is very efficient. And when you add into the home, the smart thermometers, I mean, what you get is for the customer, a really efficient system. And it is a cost-effective system. It's already, let's say, already priced to scale. So. Thanks very much, Denise. And sorry for um, misrepresenting what you did there. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. And Jan, we've talked a bit about the importance of demand response and uh, dynamic tariffs and things like that. Can you go, can you delve a little bit more into uh, integrating heat pumps into virtual power plants, shifting loads from one point uh, another to the, um, and how this affects the future of heating? Mm. So basically, again, uh, the electrical, uh, electrification of heating has this advantage of serving the grid, yeah? because at the very end, simply speaking, a home is kind of a battery. Yeah, I mean, you can to some degree overheat it. I mean, overheating, we are not talking about really don't make the uh, home hot, but just one, one uh, degree more yeah, over the day, for example, can can low, uh, can low shift a lot of load, for example. Yeah? Also, also, if you have a, you know, uh, a water tank, for example, yeah? and heat the water tank up properly, 
uh, water tank can uh, store heat for a long time. Uh, so not only for one day, but a few days also. So shifting loads, um, looking at the thermal abilities of a home and a water tank, I think is very beneficial for grid operators. So basically the heat pump for me is kind of the, basically the, the perfect technology for grid operators, especially in the residential sector uh, to, to shift loads. Um, and it's of course comes with a benefit for end customers as time of use tariffs are scaling, yeah, because they can benefit from from prices when they are low, yeah, or even negative. Uh, so I think the integration of heat pump with uh, PV system, with storage systems, uh, thermal or battery electric uh, storage systems, um, is is uh, of true benefit. Uh, for every customer, end customer, and for the entire, you know, uh, infrastructure. Thanks, Jan. And one uh, question from the audience who wants to turn the discussion a little bit from theory into practice. Um, going a little bit personal, do any of you have a heat pump or do you have any personal experiences with a heat pump? Anyone can take the lead there. Well, I can say that I have used a heat pump in one of my previous properties, which was fantastic. In Sweden, actually, it's very, very common to use a heat pump for, for heating. Very, very efficient, um, good, consistent temperature whenever needed. I, I didn't have any issues with it. Unfortunately, now I am in Italy, so I have gas heating, which, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, quite a challenge because the bills are absolutely extortionate. <laughs> Yeah, maybe Thanks, maybe Penny. like from, from my yeah. point of view, unfortunately I have a flat, yeah. So so I'm renting a flat, so I have no heat pump, uh, but I have a uh, dynamic tariff since like almost a year. But working for a heat pump OEM, of course, I know a lot of people owning a heat pump, and I think like you know this question usually comes from regions where heat pumps are not yet so much adapted, right? Um, where people ha still have questions. Um, and looking into heat pumps, it's not a new technology. I mean, we are producing heat pumps more than a decade already, our companies even more. It's a very proven technology. It's one of the leading technologies in the Nordics, Yeah, where outside temperatures are far colder than uh, in, in Germany. Uh, heat pumps are already far more scaled. Yeah, I mean, they are basically leading the market by far as a technology. Uh, so to everybody who is afraid of a heat pump in terms of, oh, it's a new technology and I don't want to be a guinea pig, I need to answer, no, you don't, you, you are not. There are, there are millions of customers since decades using heat pumps uh, and don't be afraid about the heat pump. Heat pumps work perfectly and are just a great technology. And Do you think that is... also to add yeah, to this yeah. from Jan, I think one important factor is also that over the last couple of years, the high temperature heat pumps have become also much better. I mean, Vineland is one example, there are many more. And so also for the retrofit now, these systems work perfectly well, really comparable to a gas boiler. I agree. Thank you. And do you think there is still this fear around heat pumps and how can we kind of erode that fear and, and make it really publicly accessible and spread that knowledge that it, they are easy to use, that they are proven? Jan, if you want to continue. I think especially like in the last two years, somehow a lot of myths were coming up in context of heat pumps. Um, but generally speaking, I can just recall that also the people in our organization who are basically engineers for our gas solutions love heat pumps. Yeah, so... I mean, it, it's clear that this is a very great technology that nobody needs to be scared about it. That's highly proven. Uh, and I would honestly, for myself, if I would be able to buy uh, or build a home, I would immediately choose a heat pump. Yeah, Because to me, it's clear that the future uh, of heating is a heat pump. Yeah? Um, having said that, of course, like, you know, overall, uh, we need to do better communication potentially as an industry, yeah, uh, but uh, as a society overall as well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, this. I think that communication for sure is one thing, but you know, also penetration is one thing because I think, like, especially in the Nordics where you have already high penetration, nobody would ask this question, yeah, because everybody would know somebody who has a heat pump. 
uh, and everybody would tell like in terms of mouth to mouth uh, uh, propaganda, I would say, yeah, that this is this is truly a great technology. And I think especially in the regions like some regions of Germany, but also some other regions, uh, yeah, if your neighbor has a heat pump and you are able to ask him or her uh, if she is uh, happy uh, with the technology, uh, then I think, you know, this will be an easy way forward, yeah, because this is a technology where we have a lot of, you know, super happy customers with. So I, I don't see there energy, any technology challenge, but rather a communication challenge, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. And Claire, maybe from a more regulatory perspective, do you think regulation is kind of strict enough when it comes to phasing out gas and oil boilers and eventually banning them and, and bringing in heat pumps or could more be done? So I think um, in the ideal, no one, no one will be sort of ripping out a fully functional heating system before it's reaching the end of its life. And we do need to do, um, you know, we do need to transition from now, but we don't need to kind of uh, transition all at once um, and I think there is a lot of um, I mean I can talk a bit about the UK policy context where I know the most um, there's a lot more that can be done to encourage heat pump rollout so um, the heat pump rollout has been very slow in the UK to date um, there are some really encouraging policies being introduced but one of the big blockers is still um, the, the gap between the price of electricity and the price of gas so a lot of the policy costs um, are put on the, on the electricity side. And that means that um, you could install, incur the upfront costs of, of a heat pump and then actually be left with higher um, running costs. Um, the government is has committed to, to looking at ways to change that. So, so more is, is, is going to, to happen there. I think the other thing, so I have to confess, I don't have a heat pump and I've been trying to get one. <laughs> I live in a, a, a poorly insulated um, Victorian terrace and I haven't found um, uh, a, an installer who's, who's willing to put in a heat pump yet. Um, and I think um, that is um, definitely um, something that is partly potentially due to the fact that policies have jumped around so much in the in the UK that the installer base um, hasn't really um, developed and it is quite difficult to to find the expertise and um, particularly if you if you live in a kind of older property. Drop me an email. We will help you with that. Oh, I certainly <laughs> <you> will. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Bringing people together. We love to see it. <laughs> um, Denise, could you maybe share a little bit more about regulation or the, the different stakeholders involved in kind of shifting to sustainable heating on a, on a larger scale? So not just in households, but also, uh, you know, on a, on a larger scale as well. Sure. I mean, when you're when you're looking at larger scale decarbonisation, so if you are, for example, a school or a hospital or a hotel or or some sort of an in, an industry, you have to you have to look at what heat you have available because very often there is a, a source of waste heat available. Uh, for example, if you if you're some sort of a manufacturing facility or a hotel where you're we have kitchens, you're going to have a heat stream available that can be captured. So it, it's not just a question of looking at what is your existing heating system, but also looking to see, is there a waste heat stream there? Or is there a waste heat stream nearby? Because you can capture heat from multiple different sources into a thermal storage, into a, a seasonal thermal storage. And, and that's saving it up for when it's actually needed, which again is going to reduce the demand on the electrical usage when you install your, your heat pumps. It's also from a, um, from a large, let's say if you're if you're a school and you have a, a heating demand that is over 300 megawatt hours you need to decarbonize that if you've got oil you're paying a lot at the moment so whereas it doesn't always make sense to retrofit an existing system it might be better to wait as claire said until that system has has run its course but in the case where you're paying an extortionate amount it can actually be more cost effective to replace the, the roof, you can still use the same system that's inside. You don't necessarily need to um, rip out the, the existing radiators, etc. You can retrofit where you just add the heat pumps, some seasonal storage and a, a solar thermal roof, and you'll be able to meet the demand with a, the COP running at its high or the, the heat pump running at its highest COP throughout the heating season. 
and with a lower energy cost than you would have had. So you're not pumping up your electricity bill. What you're doing is reducing your your oil bill and also reducing the energy bill that you would have had if you had just replaced with a heat pump. So there's lots of options there. I do personally believe that the way to go is district heating because with district heating, you can capture and combine all of the different heat sources. And in that scenario as well, you're, you know, where you take... A, a town or a city or you know multiple buildings together you can you can capitalize on what's available locally so i would say when you when communities look to see what can we do to decarbonize they need to look to see who has heat who has heat who has a demand and how can we kind of pair up so in in the case of large flats you can pair up a couple of flats together and come together to get one system that's going to meet the demand for all of those houses and at a let's say at a at a lower cost than you would have had if you were just using oil or gas or or another similar thing but district heating is uh, it's the most cost effective and again uh, as somebody who's lived in Scandinavia for over a decade i can tell you that district heating is the cheapest way to heat your house. Um, a heat pump, brilliant. It's like a, it's if you're if you're not on the district heating network, you get a heat pump. I mean that just and that's just it just makes sense in Scandinavia. But of course, you go to the UK, you go to Ireland, of other countries around Europe, and it's just not understood and it's not known. So, yeah. Does anyone want to add anything to that? We're all agreed. Perfect. <laughs> uh, we've had a question from the audience, um, which I'll direct to either Jan or Claire, whoever wants to take it. Uh, what is the key role that software must play in the next five to 10 years to truly scale a heat pump rollout in Europe? Software, Jan, do yeah. you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, good, a good question. I mean, uh, software is the enabler for many things. Yeah? Um, and potentially, I take this from a different angle. Um, so as I said, like one of the biggest challenge of, you know, getting into a sustainable heating world is the deployment of new technologies such as heat pumps. Yeah? And um, the deployment is being able to be facilitated by the digitalization. For example, um, the installation process. Yeah? To, to streamline the installation process with the help of digitalization is something which is a true lever to diffuse these technologies into the market. Yeah? Um, I give you one specific example. The parameterization of a heat pump system is not so simple. Yeah, you have like 60 parameters more or less. Yeah, an installer needs to go down, you know, do all this parameterization. So the heat pump is ideally, you know, configured to the home and the user profile of, of whoever is living in the home. Um, and this takes time. And uh, in, in best case, the only thing then the installer does is basically the, the things you need, you know, hands for, and that everything else is being automated, right? Um, so basically, you're basically, simply speaking, plugging in the, the, uh, the heat pump into uh, the, the, the energy network of the home, and basically everything else is being cascaded down automatically. Um, and this is, this is something which potentially will save half an hour time during the entire installation and commissioning. Half an hour doesn't sound too much if you only consider one installation, but if you consider millions of installations, this is a strong lever. And, you know, this is just one part where digitalization will take a major role in terms of, you know, driving the sustainability of heating. Thanks, Jan. And we've only got four minutes left. So I want to ask the round kind of summary final question. What do you think is the key trend or technology that we're seeing in the heating space that's enabling the heating transition at the moment? And what can we expect or what are you most excited for in the future? Till, maybe starting with you. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, like Jan said, I think the technology is already there when you look at all the different energy assets and there will be incremental improvements, right? But for me, the core really lies in connecting the dots um, in the connectivity of all these assets and the software uh, to control them. Um, so I think one, one thing, it, it maybe sounds small, but there, there's currently a new standard or connectivity uh, standard popping up in the smart home world called FRAT and the application layer, layer is Matter. 
and um, all the big uh, smart home companies like Google, Amazon, Apple are building on that. And what I see now is that many smart thermostat companies and heating OEMs uh, that will use the same standard or working on the same standard in the future. And that means that both worlds, smart home and smart energy will merge further, will become more open, and it will open up a vast amount of new propositions and use cases for the further adoption of um, of, uh, of, of also sustainable and, and, and smart heating. So this is on, on this connectivity and software side, I see the, um, the big developments over the next 10 years. Thanks, Till. Claire, what about you? No, I'm um, excited to think about the future when we have warm, well-insulated homes, because I think um, at the moment, um, many people, not only have they got a fossil fuel system that's contributing to emissions, but they're also not very comfortable in their homes because of the cost and the, the fact um, uh, that, that, that it's not um, brilliantly insulated. Um, so that's what's exciting and inspiring me. I think heat pumps will be on the march. And one of the things that I find interesting at the moment is uh, people's use of sort of supplementary electric heating, like blankets and so forth, uh, when they're working from home. I think it's quite an underexplored area in the analysis, not a long term solution, but but an interesting one in the transition. Thanks, Claire. Nice. Uh, Jan, what about you? Mm, yeah, I think I, to a large degree, would um, align with Till. I think like the standardization of uh, interoperability will be for sure a, a very big lever um, inside the heating industry, but also combining different industries in, in you know, this sustainability area. Um, but overall, I would say, I mean, whatever you do basically as an end customer, uh, you know, to, to grow into more sustainability is it, helpful. And, you know, my, my motivation would be to tell everybody, you know, just, you know, just, you know, just look into the solutions which may fit you best yeah, and, and go forward. And if it's a gas solution, um, I mean, don't, don't have, you know, a, too bad feeling about it because potentially a modern gas system will save also a lot of energy versus your very old gas system. Ideally, of course, a heat pump would be also, in my opinion, the best solution. But I think we need to grow a little bit out of, you know, the industry of saying, okay, you know, he's the good guy and he's the bad guy and more thinking about of a portfolio and every incremental step is worth doing. Yeah? So that that's hopefully a mindset we will have a little bit more in future. Nice mindset approach. Thanks, Jan. And Denise, final words? So I would be inclined to agree with, let's say, all of the above. I, I really think that software and control is going to be critical because the software and control will allow the, the utilization of all of the different components from the different ecosystems. And I think artificial intelligence as well. So the learning of how the system is performing and the adaptation of the system based on that. But as Claire very rightly pointed out, it's not as beneficial if the building in which this wonderful system is running ha doesn't have the, the basic insulation and the double double or triple glazing and you know so eventually what i'd love to see is that we have underfloor heating everywhere that can run at a lower temperature and you know and energy efficient systems that are that are making sure that we're not wasteful but i think we're we're quite away from that but it's it's i do believe this is a very exciting time it's going to be an interesting transition and there's a, there's a lot in the mix Thank you, Denise. And thank you to all of our speakers for the really uh, interesting discussion today. Uh, a lot to look forward to. And uh, I think uh, a lot of key players in the round that can make that change happen. So thank you. Have a great day. And uh, yeah, we'll chat to you next time. Thanks, guys.